Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. The Wilson Center launched a new initiative for 2020, spotlighting its work in four cross-regional areas. One of those looks at the changing Arctic, the new landscapes that are emerging, implications for commerce, commerce and security, and how people live in the region. Our guest today is the point person for that topic, Mike Sfrega. Mike directs the Wilson Center's Global Risk and Resilience Program and its Polar Institute. Mike, welcome back. Good to see you. Thank you, John. Welcome back from uh, your road trips. You've been it's on been the road. a few road trips. You put on a lot of frequent flyer miles, yeah. sir. So we're calling this area New Arctic Landscape Security Commodities and Communities. Mm -hmm. This has been something that you as an, uh, an Alaska resident and someone who's been tuned into the issue have seen coming before the rest of the world started to pay attention. Give us an overview. Uh, why does this topic matter today? Yeah, it's the Arctic now is a global Arctic. It's no longer this sort of mythical place up a, up on a, or the side of California on a, on a weather map. Yeah, or where Santa Claus lives Santa Claus or house like or, that, or a bad you know. sci-fi 1954 sci-fi movie or something. I mean, it really has become part of the global narrative. When you think about the Arctic now, you think about international trade, commerce, security, national secu security, homeland defense, commodities, commerce. I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons why. So really, it's become a globalized Arctic. And the reason for that is the main driver is a changing climate. You know, our, our planet is not so much warming as it is just heating. Melting. And it's melting. And a new ocean is opening you know, for the first time in at least humankind. How, from when you started to, to uh, track this trend yeah. and, and pay attention to what was happening to where we are today, has the, the rate of melt and consequently, the the rate of landscape change happened way beyond expectations. Yeah, I mean, you know, all models are helpful, but you know, a lot of them are wrong. And the really, what we have seen is an acceleration in the pack ice melting, thirteen percent per decade since nineteen seventy nine. That's a lot of pack ice that has disappeared. And what happens is you get this what's called a positive feedback loop, which is really negative, because mm -hmm. as the ice recedes, the gray, the dark of the ocean absorbs heat. And so it's just one vicious cycle. And well, so that the, pack ice is melting from the top and the bottom. Because of Correct. It's ambient temperature and then the temperature of the ocean as well. And with that, you have thawing of permafrost, which is you know is a problem for everything from therm everything from uh, communities that that live on a coast to just the environment. The Arctic used to be a carbon sink. Now carbon is into the air because of the thawing permafrost. So this this is a major issue for just on the environmental side. You, you mentioned the communities before we talk about maybe some of the geopolitics and yeah. trade and those types of things. Talk about those, those communities. What, what are you seeing on the ground? How are people's lives changing? Well, for, for Alaska, there's significant change. In fact, a lot of places in the north, but the coastal Alaskan communities really are feeling the brunt of the changing climate. What used to protect these these communities, the pack ice from storms and storm surge, and well, that pack ice is gone, and so they see a lot more storm surge, ferocious storms that used to be stopped by pack ice. They're they're not stopped anymore, and it's a double whammy. You've got both storm surge uh, from the ocean, but you also have thawing permafrost. So the ground underneath them literally is melting and eroding at the same time from the coastline. And there's over three dozen communities in the state of Alaska alone that are in danger and must be moved in the next, pick it, 10 years, 15 years. Some, and you're talking about moving entire towns and whole villages. Ta whole villages. I mean, it's, it's really a significant issue, uh, including like the village of Newtok, which is actually in the process of moving nine miles upriver to much more stable area. So what you're describing is adaptation, not stopping anything, adapting to what's happening. Total adaptation. Out of control. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, you can't mitigate. And the issue is not from an Arctic perspective. I mean, this is global heating, global warming, but it's impacting the Arctic ferociously. So when we look at the geopolitics, whatever it might be, new, tr new uh, mm -hmm. shipping lanes, uh, are we looking at an environment that is, uh, right now at least, more about cooperation than it is about competition? Mm -hmm. Or how, how would you balance those scales? Uh, there's a lot more cooperation right now in the Arctic. It's, it's a, it really is a zone of peace, question mark, right? But, you know, as, new, as this new ocean emerges, so do other uh, nations' interest in the Arctic as well. Singapore, China, you know, Russia, of course, the United States. Greenland has become a major issue. If you want to look at anything emblematic of the New North, look at Greenland. It's got everything. It's got a melting uh, Greenland ice sheet. So that's climate change. It has indigenous communities that are trying to figure out how they sustain, build, sustain an economy for the future. The geopolitics is rather interesting because it's politically and geographically well situated, and NATO would like to keep it as part of the NATO alliance. 
but you know, Russia and China have interests in the Arctic as well. And so you see, we're not gonna go to war anytime soon, but you see this growing interest and actually an increase in militarization, right? Russia has refurbished old Soviet era bases. They have built new bases along the Northern Sea Route. If I was President Putin, I'm not sure I would do anything different than that, securing my own economic future. Russia's future goes through the Arctic. It just does, oil and gas development. So whenever you have uh, an economy that's based on oil and gas, especially in the Arctic, you're going to protect your assets. So you see a lot more interest, significant investment from China in the Arctic as well. So will we go to war anytime soon? No, but it sure has become more geostrategic and geopolitical over the last 10, 15 years than it was 20 years ago. Even at the height of the Cold War, there were issues, but, but this, is, this is different now. When it comes to the, the laws of the land, or, or maybe the laws of the sea in this mm -hmm. case, uh, is there a, a, an organism or a, a mechanism to coordinate among these various players? For some of the issues of the Arctic, like the Arctic Council, over two decades of great cooperation, uh, and it is a place where all eight nations must, it's a consensus building body, so all eight nations do come together on certain certain issues, mostly environmental focus, but, but not everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, binding agreements have been agreed upon by all eight nations. So there's search and rescue agreements, there's oil spill and prevention agreements, there's a, there's a science and research agreement. So there are places where the Arctic Gate do cooperate, including U.S. and Russia. In fact, the U.S. and Russia have led a lot of the charge in a lot of these good cooperative mechanisms. So th there's built-in mechanisms there. There's built-in mechanisms through the U.N. on who gets to claim parts of the seabed as their own territory. There's process in there. So I don't think that's going to be a problem. The real issue, especially coming back from the Munich Security Conference last week, is this issue of where does the dialogue happen on security in the Arctic? And there's no mechanism for that. Some would say it's NATO, some would say it's, it's other venues, but really nobody has created a venue just for Arctic security. You didn't mention the UN. Is the UN involved in this discussion? The UN is involved on, in components, but not on the security component. They're involved in who gets to say whether or not this piece of seabed belongs to your country. So you actually have to prove scientifically for instance, that the seabed of, called the Russian Federation, goes all the way out to the North Pole. They've made a claim to the UN that says that their uh, continental shelf goes all the way out and their, the seabed goes all the way out to the North Pole. So they have to submit that to the UN and there's a whole deliberative body that goes through that. And if there's overlapping claims, those will get adjudicated. So there's a process there. Is there, uh, in this area of security where you say there, there isn't the infrastructure in place to mediate these, these mm -hmm. potential disputes, uh, are there ideas out being floated? Does anybody have a plan for that? Well, there have been multiple ideas. One is to just create an Arctic that looks like the Antarctic Treaty, right? But that's not gonna happen. All eight nations are involved, five coastal nations are involved, there's economic development, that's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, but there has been some discussion about whether or not we should have some mechanism for Arctic security. I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon. We have been involved in those discussions. It might be that they're just informal discussions that happen. What would be the best is to have a mill-to-mill -mill relationship uh, with the Russian Federation, not because of Ukraine, Crimea, and other issues that just that just hasn't happened in a number of years but there have been mechanisms used before Crimea those are on hold for obvious reasons but there are mechanisms that could be resurrected that could address Arctic security Will the issues. Arctic Council expand its its purview it will not I mean they there have been discussions about that and the Arctic Council sees themselves not in the security business they see themselves in issues that I just talked about research uh, scientific cooperation oil spill, search and rescue, sort of the civil, def civil defense, civil security mm -hmm. issues, not hard military securities. What are, where are the most fertile areas for opportunities? Are they largely around resources? Mostly around resource development, commodity development, everything from nickel to uh, rare earth, to oil to gas. However, tourism is a major issue. If you go to Reykjavik, you will see tourists from all over the world in, mm -hmm. in Reykjavik. I don't know what it does, doubles, triples that country's uh, population during during the year. Uh, we see a lot of interest in Greenland. Obviously, it's been in the news, but there's interest there. Uh, Northern Canada, uh, Alaska, Norway, Sweden, Finland. There's this kind of a renaissance in Arctic tourism. A, it's accessible. Cruise ships are now willing to take that risk with Coast Guard Escort to go through the Arctic. You pay a lot of money, but for the first time, it becomes much more feasible. The problem is a lot more people go to the Arctic, and it's the tyranny of distance. You, if something happens in the north, very few nations have the resources to go help a tour ship in the Arctic. That's why the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, which is an, a, a panel of uh, leading experts from the Coast Guard and, and leaders from the Coast Guard that meet on a regular basis to talk about interoperability and how they would help a tour ship, 
an oil spill, uh, you know, address address those particular issues. But um, it's mostly around resource development. You see the shipping, oil and gas development. We, uh, the the humankind, unfortunately, does not have a great track record when it comes to the treatment of indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, have we learned enough from the past that the indigenous populations in the region will get a seat at the table and get a fair shake? Yeah, I think there's been much more, I'm hopeful, let's put it that way, that this is not just a seat at the table, it's actually their table, right? Yeah. It's their they table. They should be doing the inviting. They should be doing the inviting. However, we have to be you know, realistic about this. These are nation states with foreign ministers and defense ministers, and, but there is a very powerful voice to be had uh, at their table. They should be cons considered a part of the uh, challenge, part of the challenge equation to solve challenges. They should be part of the governance solutions. There should be local governance on a lot of things like whether or not a town should have a tourist ship. Who gets to say? Well, it should be perhaps local governments that say that, and mostly these are indigenous communities. Um, much more interest, uh, at least from the United States side, in having the Alaska Native population inform and influence what happens in Alaska vis-a-vis -vis the military. There's been a very good handoff between the two, uh, you know, two populations. So I see, I'm, I'm hopeful there. And there's a recognition that actually indigenous people have a lot to teach us about the environment. So you see a lot of Western scientists leaning, not just asking, but leaning on indigenous uh, leaders for their knowledge about the landscape and climate and other areas that are of interest to them. So I'm hopeful. Mike, Mike, you move back and forth between the Great White North and, and the, the lower 48. And so you, I know that the congressional delegation of Alaska that you work closely with uh, is, is very tuned into this. What about the uh, legislature from the rest of America? Mm. Uh, have they really clued into this? Do they view themselves as an Arctic nation? Are, are they active in the policy making that's going to take place around the region? Yeah, for the most part, no. Uh, you see the delegation from Maine, especially Senator King leans way forward on, on the Arctic. Uh, Senator Cantwell from Washington, very much interested in the Arctic. So you see the, you know, the, other, the other poles of our country, Maine and, and Washington. But I've learned from you, you don't have to live there to be affected by it. You, that's right, and that's what people are starting to realize is that you know, if, you're, if you're in Miami, you, you know all about sea rise, you know, you know about flooding at, at, uh, at high tide. Well, you can, you can make some connections between a rising sea level and melting ice. So you, and you also can see the shifting uh, patterns of, of weather so if you're a farmer in Iowa, you, you're now starting to understand what happens when you melt glaciers, melt the Arctic Ocean, you change weather patterns. Over a long time, that becomes a climate pattern. So you're seeing delegations like the Florida delegation, who is quite interested in what happens in the Arctic and the Antarctic because it actually impacts coastal communities. But in terms of legislators from across our country understanding that we're an Arctic nation, we have a long way to go. The Alaska delegation has been pushing that rock up the hill for a very long time. Now, because of national security issues, because of Russia, because of China, there's a whole lot more, I think, interest and knowledge up on the Hill as to what's happening in the Arctic, but it's taken a national security bend uh, to kind of awaken the interest uh, of most legislators. So, uh, Mike, give us a preview looking ahead. You mentioned that you were just at the Munich Security Conference. And what, are, what are the upcoming activities that the Polar Institute is gonna be focusing on? Well, we're gonna take a hard look at the China-Russia relationship in the Arctic. We, we see that that's uh, not just from an investment point of view, but strategically, it's rather interesting, right? As we look at the great power competition within the Wilson Center, well, the Arctic is a place where it can play out. It's really strategic and of interest to the United States. And the Arctic is at the nexus of a lot of different issues, whether it's oil and gas, uh, maritime shipping, Greenland, these are all great power competition issues. Uh, we'll take a hard look at that. We'll be working with our colleagues in Greenland and the Kingdom of Denmark. Uh, we will we'll be looking at national security issues. We're looking at homeland security issues. We have a coast that is now no longer protected uh, by the ice. We will take a look at indigenous communities as well. About a year and a half ago, we had a program on the, the village of Nutak. We're gonna come back and revisit as to where that village is now in their transition to, to a new location. Uh, we'll be looking at relationships like the US and Japan in the Arctic, long time research partners in the Arctic. Look at the connection between the Antarctic and the Arctic environmentally. We'll be taking a hard look at that as well. So it's, it's just this buffet, which represents the Arctic, of issues that we need to take care of, everything from communities to commerce to cooperation to competition.
Mike mentioned the, the New Talk story, and we did a, a program yeah. with some leaders from the community. We'll make sure, if you're watching this video, that if you look on the page, you'll find a link to that uh, video as well, so you can hear directly from the, the people involved. Mike, thank you. It's thank fun you, to God. live vicariously through the exciting <laughs> perch that you have yeah, in watching this dynamic area of the globe evolve. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. And, and if you would like to continue to follow the story, lots of terrific resources can be found at wilsoncenter.org, both under the Polar Institute, Global Resource uh, Risk and, and, and uh, uh, risk Resilience and Program. Resilience Program, not Responsibility Program. And also a new collection page for this initiative, New Arctic Landscape Securities, Commodities, and Communities. So we hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us.